Okay, so um, I'm actually not going to do something. I'm going to probably be my talk's probably be a bit broader than um, some of the others. Maybe a bit less specialist. Probably more geared towards what's happening in the general public rather than say like the arts community or in the sort of innovation scenes. And a lot of my work involves looking at monetary systems and sort of uh, the politics of money. And you know, crypto is like a small little subset of that. But it's a very small subset of that, right? Um, crypto probably affects, I don't know, maximum like 5% of the people in the world. So the vast majority of people operate with the normal monetary system. Um, so I'm going to look at the, this war for our wallets, the sort of, a, the sort of a kind of like the the day-to-day -day battles that are going on within the normal monetary system and how that relates to um, some broader stuff. Um, part of this has comes out of my book, Cloud Money. This is the last book that I did. Um, it's in a bunch of languages, so, well, it's not in Greek. It'd be nice to get a Greek translation. If any, if any of you know any Greek um, uh, publishers that want to do, do it, um, let me know. Um, but Cloud Money is basically looking at, if you zoom out, the, the, the fusion of big finance and big tech, right? Um, which is like a meta process in the global economic system. That's been happening for quite some time. If you, if you, Fast forward back to like the financial crisis, everyone was concerned about you know, the finance sector, right? The biggest companies in the world used to be like big oil companies and, and finance companies. In the last 10 years, that's changed a lot, right? All the biggest companies in the world are now tech companies. So uh, what we've been seeing really is a fusion between big tech platforms and finance platforms. And in reality, big tech platforms cannot operate unless they're plugged into gigantic digital finance infrastructures, right? So that's a, a big meta process that's going on in global capitalism, but it's uh, manifesting, for example, in a cultural attack on the cash system. So if you're hanging out in places like London right now, for example, you'll find the sort of almost like a virus spreading where non-digital, non-automated money is being eliminated, right? And it's presented as being some kind of bottom-up cultural process where everyone's sort of naturally turning towards digital money. Um, but I'm kind of, I'm basically calling it out and saying it's got nothing to do with what you as an individual want. It's what global capitalism requires, right? Um, you know, to put it bluntly. And, you know, you can reverse engineer a mentality in yourself that you are the one that desired this, this new form of automation. But this, this process goes beyond stuff like physical cash. So you'll see this in all kinds of automation processes, right, which they're initially kind of sold as somehow being um, emerging because people desire them and that people want convenience or people want to save time or whatever. In reality, automation never does that. All right, in an actual capitalist system, automation emerges because firms are trying to cut their costs and trying to optimize their profits. Um, and they'll just use it, they'll, they'll just convert that automation into an increased consumption and production rather than leisure time for people. So the whole illusion that somehow this has got anything to do with like our desire for convenience is a, is a kind of like a, maybe like it's like a narrative you slap on top of that process to make yourself feel better, all right? But the fact that you basically have no agency in the global capitalist system. All right, now, I'm putting out quite a blunt narrative. There are nuances to it. But I also deliberately make it blunt because on the other side, we have an equally blunt narrative, right? Which is that everyone desires technology and it's all for our own benefit, blah, blah, blah. You know the story. You'll, you see it every single day. Um, so this book is deliberately designed as a kind of counterweight to sort of create this, um, uh, and maybe you can sort of meet it in the middle. Um, if you want to also see, I also have the Substack. Um, uh, called Altered States of Monetary Consciousness, where I, where I expand upon lots of this stuff and go deeper into particular issues. So if you're ever looking to sort of delve into the, the depths of, of some of these issues, um, this has a lot more, a lot more recent stuff. Um, so I thought maybe I would... And I'm aware a lot of you here are like sophisticated theorists and stuff, but bear in mind the average person I'm... I'm talking to as a person you've got to try and who doesn't do sophisticated theory, right? Um, and who you're you know, trying to get them to understand these processes. I actually designed this talk for a group of corporate lawyers um, a couple of weeks ago. I did this talk for them, right? And, and 
trying to get you know, corporate lawyers to think critically about the global economy. Um, and so a lot of my work is, is, is tends to be geared towards people who don't necessarily perceive themselves as being part of the intellectual elite necessarily. Right? Um, so one of the first things I, I always want to try and stress to anybody is like, if you want to understand any of these issues, you've got to understand the basic global, global meta-narrative that exists in our world, right? our basic progress narrative. Um, and right now, the basic idea of what progress means in the mainstream circles is anything that increase, increases speed, scale, um, interconnection, and via automation. Right? That's our basic progress story. And that's been going on for a long time in economic systems, right? We've had multiple waves of that process. Right now, it happens to be all about digitization, right? because digitization is the frontier of how you speed things up, scale things up, uh, make things more connected, um, and automate stuff, right? And so even when I'm looking at AI narratives, I, I, I actually, I don't even like thinking about AI. I'm just like, it's a form of automation. Right? It's an extension, it's a new extension of automation. We fixate on AI, but it's just like automating things that haven't yet been automated, really. Um, and so it, I would never separate it from the, from the tradition of all the other forms of automation. Um, and so the, the current meta-narrative, and, and, and you know, I do lots of talks around the world, and this meta-narrative meta you find everywhere, right? regardless of what country it is, and regardless of whether it makes any sense in that particular country. All right? So this is one, one important thing is... Um, to realize that across the world there's, one, there's this one standard story um, with, with variations, right? It's not completely, completely standard. Um, but actually, then you'll find this, like, you know, in, in South Africa, where I'm from, a lot of this digital stuff really makes no sense. Electricity is off for six hours a day, for example, in South Africa, right? And yet you'll still find politicians talking about this stuff, right? As if it makes sense in that context, which means there's a, there's a power structure to this narrative. It's, it's coming from somewhere else beyond, beyond South Africa, right? Um, and so this is the meta-narrative, um, and it's actually one of the interesting things I noticed recently uh, with the, maybe with AI, is that there's been a sort of slight dip in public belief in this meta-narrative, all right? There's been an, an increase, in, increase in the anxiety that people are, are feeling. Um, and I really started thinking about this when I saw this revolting piece of religious work from Mark Andreessen. I don't know if you guys know Mark Andreessen, but he's like one of the world's top venture capitalists. He runs one of the world's biggest venture capital firms. He's actually a big investor in a bunch of crypto stuff. Um, they've basically been colonizing the crypto space for some time now. Right? Uh, Mark Andreessen felt it necessary a couple of weeks ago to put this out, which is like a kind of like grotesque, it's like very 80s like retro piece of work where he just repeats a bunch of like banal shit about like, well, uh, technology is great and markets are great. It's like, it's like he got enough time machine and went back to like sort of Margaret Thatcher days and just, like, just repeated a bunch of stuff that's been thoroughly critiqued for like decades now, all right? And in a way, he just, he just sort of stated it again. It's like, okay, if you're against technology, you're a drag on humanity. If, basically, if you're not me, you're a drag on humanity, right? So in, in reality, as a political work, it's designed to be a puff piece for the venture capital industry to say, when I go into work each morning, what I'm doing is the work of God. I'm not just a pawn for the inhuman forces of capital, right? Um, I'm doing everybody a gigantic favor uh, by pushing forward all this kind of stuff. Um, but it's interesting that he felt the need to do it because he keeps on railing against what he calls pessimists here, all right? And he thinks it's a new phenomenon. Um, basically, anybody who's having doubts about technology, right? And it's quite interesting that it's, it's at this moment that he's thinking about it because you know, the traditional story that was told about automation was always like, oh, it's going to save you from toil. It's going to save you from all this kind of work and stuff. And suddenly, the stuff that's getting automated is the stuff that people were told that they, that they would be able to do once they were saved from toil, right? You can write poetry, you can sing songs and play music and all this kind of stuff. All the generative AI is basically just like coming in and being like, we'll do that too. We'll automate that too, you know? It's like the system that only has one gear. It only knows how to do one thing, which is to automate everything and make a kind of simulacrum of everything, right? Um, and so he's trying to not justify it because he's realizing that there's public backlash against this. Um, but it's, it's part of this, you know, he's a very particular concentrated version of that progress narrative, but the more diluted version you find everywhere and the sort of politicians repeating it and so on. Um, so this is what we, the sort of like, 
in the mainstream at least, the kind of like, you know, situation we're sitting in, but it generates a whole bunch of sub-narratives as well. This is important when you want to look at how, um, how this stuff gets reported on, for example, in the media. So if once you set up the idea that there's this kind of inevitable um, automation, digitization, expansion, you know, acceleration kind of thing, and that it's a sort of natural and inevitable, it will generate these other narratives by, by default, right? You'll have what the sort of the Silicon Valley version, which is to say, you know, we are the bold adventurers who are pushing this forward. We are leading the way. But then there'll be something like, if you don't want to lead the way, you better keep up, all right? Um, because we're going without you. Um, that in turn will generate this left behind narrative, which is super, super crucial in this whole ideology, which is like, if you don't do this, you're going to be screwed, all right? Which is the actual reality. This is what's quite interesting because a lot of the Silicon Valley crew and Mark and Dries and all these people, they, they paint this like heroic picture of themselves as doing something that's almost like voluntary. Um, but then there's this like weird um, thing that they'll then subtly, subtly accept, which is like, nobody has any choice in the end, do we? All right. If you don't do it, you're basically fucked. Right? And that's what the actual reality is um, in an actual large scale system. Um, and the left behind narrative in turn generates an inclusion narrative, which is say, if the people who've been left behind, we better save them, right? Let's save them. Um, or alternatively, you can have, create this delay narrative, which is what the politicians try to do, which is say, oh, well, let's try to slow it down to give people a chance to get on board because otherwise they'll be left behind and so on. Um, and so this, you'll find this all over the press when, um, in any kind of these issues that involve automation, right? Um, within payments, it manifests in a particular way, right? Um, and part of this is to do the fact, one of the nuances when it comes with payments is that um, the public in general has a very poor understanding of the monetary system already, okay? So it's gonna intersect with this poor understanding of the monetary system. Uh, when, the, when the sort of meta-narrative collides with those, you get this, these very bizarre ideas about what's happening to money. So in the public, you often have uh, what I, I just sometimes call it the, the one type of money illusion, all right? This idea that you know, the British pound or the euro or the dollar is a single currency, okay? But it has like different forms. It's a single currency, but it has like slightly different like manifestations. A bit like, you know, there's an acoustic guitar and there's an electric guitar. They're both guitars, but they're, they're kind of like different variations of each other. Um, people think about this with, with money and you'll see it in, in visual imagery as well. They'll have like, well, what's happening with a transition to digital payments is cash is kind of like becoming digital. This, this, this one form of money is transforming, it's upgrading into some other kind of form of money, okay? And you'll see it in all the visual imagery. It's always about cash flying through wires, cash coming through computers, cash becoming binary code is very common, all right? Implicit in this is the idea that like, there's some kind of transubstantiation going on. This thing's becoming, this is upgrading somehow, right? Um, and so this is what you'll, you'll get, and then it'll, it'll play into this, this narrative here about, this, this upgrade is inevitable and natural, um, and you better get on board, you better lead the way, or else you're gonna be left behind. And this actually manifests in a lot of this race, racing imagery, right? Um, you can see here, there are a lot of examples of this imagined race towards this thing that's inevitable. Who's winning this race? Who's lagging in this race? You'll find this with AI too. You'll find it with pretty much anything that's going on in, in, in the tech scene, right? About this, these imagined races. Um, of course, the race will then naturally generate a left behind narrative. Who's being left behind? This is when all the people who, who are sort of expressing an apparent critique will come in and say, oh, but let's think about the people who are being left behind. And often what they, what, what they won't do is critique the overarching narrative. They'll basically accept the overarching narrative, but try to say, well, let's sort of help the people who are going to be screwed by it. All right? Um, as you can tell, I really hate this kind of stuff. And a lot of my work is like, how do you like destroy the overarching narrative rather than doing the sort of weak ass kind of like um, sort of secondary kind of narrative here. Um, but if you go, for example, in the UK, where there's this huge problem with the sort of implosion of the cash system, these apparently critical sort of like, you know, like labor politicians, for example, this is the standard thing they'll talk about. You know, oh, let's help my granddad still uses cash. It's, he's, going, he's at risk of being excluded. Um, let us help him, you know. Um, and so this is very, very common. Um, one of the sort of, I sometimes like to use this payments metaphor to try and help people think about this. Um, but one of the 
if you're applying that sort of meta, that meta narrative um, to, to monetary systems and then putting a sort of payments metaphor, it's similar to this horse cart versus sports car kind of setup, right? The digital payments industry and all the kind of digital hype people have created this idea that cash is like a horse cart of payments. And bear in mind with that, with that upgrade narrative, if you think about the history of transport, um, actually, interestingly, the first automobiles in the world used to be called horseless carriages, all right? It was the idea that it was like the same thing, but you've removed some kind of impediment. It's a horseless carriage, right? That became the automobile. Um, but you can, you can see that the, the kind of imagery, there's like a single set of roads you're using and there's all these like slow horse carts that are on it and there's people with sports cars or cars behind them trying to get them to get out of the way, being like, you know, come on, clear out, we, we need to, you know, move ahead into the future. And this is the basic um, sort of uh, imagery that's being generated by the sort of uh, digital payments industry, but not only the digital payments industry, actually any industry that's trying to sort of present itself as being like the new, as it were, right? Um, and not only this, but it's also there's a bunch of like value judgments that are then slapped on top of this, this uh, situation. So it'll be like, it's old, it's inefficient, it's dangerous, right? Versus it's new, it's efficient, it's safe. Okay, this is the standard, you know, you know Austin, you've hung out of Money 2020. This is like basic standard fare for the entire fintech industry and Money 2020 and everybody who hangs out in that scene. And if like Rishi Sunak, I, I, I forgive you. I, I, I don't forgive your, your old boss, though, who was one of the architects of this, of this, this narrative. Um, but it's very, very standard, right? Um, and so you can see why there's lots of people in the public, when you ask them about the cash system, a lot of them actually have a lot of intuitive, um, uh, you know, actually, not, I wouldn't say love, but a lot of intuitive familiarity with the cash system, but increasingly it's starting to feel like a sense of shame, like there's something wrong with them. Now, I'm not sure the situation here in Limassol, um, because this, this process is unevenly spread across the world, but you'll certainly find in places like London and Amsterdam and many of these places, that, that's, that cultural shame is spreading, right? To so be like, there's something wrong with you if you're, quote unquote, still using cash, right? You're somehow like stuck, right? Attached to this is another narrative, and this is also very common beyond this particular issue around the cash system, um, which, is a, which is an imagination of where power lies in the system, in our economic system. Okay, this often comes out of mainstream economics as well. A lot of economists would deny this, but in the political use of, of economics, this is super, super common, all right? So if you're imagining an economy as a gigantic interdependent network, which is how I do imagine economies, um, it's imagined that the power resides in the little small players, the person who's walking around the street, the so-called consumer, all right? This person who's like sort of making choices. Like there's this idea that the sort of decision-making process in an economy is deferred to all these like small-scale players who are wandering around, all right? Um, and so you'll see, for example, in lots of media reports about the cash, I'll say consumers shift to digital payments. It's like the idea is the agency resides in these small players and they're the ones who are making this push for, for, this, for this to happen, right? Um, and as you can see, I, in, in the sort of center of this picture here, this interdependent structure, I have these like larger nodes, right? Which in my mind are like the corporate sector or the big oligopoly players that exist at the center of all our industries, okay? Pretty much every single industry in the world is dominated by maybe like five players, right? Uh, I mean, give or take, there's, there's variations depending on where you, where you go. But like um, almost all industries in large scale economies are dominated by these huge oligopolies, right? But in the sort of a political mindset, what they'll say is that those players simply respond to what consumers demand. It's like they're these passive servants. If the ordinary little person demands something, you know, Google and Apple and the banks and stuff, they all just go and serve those people as if they have no agency or power themselves. They're just responding to the peripheries, all right? Which, of course, is utter bullshit in an actual economy where you have huge amounts of concentrated interests often in the middle where they have, they, 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 they comp, they're competing with each other to some extent, but they're doing huge amounts of collaboration too. I mean, I used to work in the financial sector in what's called the interbank markets, all right? The interbank markets are basically where these guys collaborate, all right? Because the, the banks, for example, they do compete with each other, it's true, but they also collaborate heavily, right? That's what the interbank markets are for. They're good, they have this like private club where they sit and do deals, and then they eventually go out to the public and then deal with the public. 
all right? Um, and so there's huge amounts of this oligopoly behavior, but in the sort of typical narrative that we hear about this around payments, it's always imagined that those players in the middle really have very little power, um, and it's all the players around the outside have all the power. The only time this ever shifts is when a CEO wants to have a heroic self-image, then they'll suddenly talk about themselves as leading stuff, all right? But if they ever get any critique, they lapse back into the idea that, no, well, but we're just doing it because all the public wants us to do it, right? So they have this ability to fluctuate between these different concepts of agency, depending on what suits their particular situation. Um, so in my work, part of what I am trying to do is destabilize that standard narrative, right? And I'm not saying there aren't elements of those stories that have validity. It's just that they're so dominant in our public storytelling that they need to be countered with a, a, a different narrative. Um, and this process, again, as I, as I mentioned, can go beyond cash into, into other areas as well, such, such as AI and so on. Um, so one of, and I, and I always try to sort of use metaphors to help people in the public understand some of these topics and also visual imagery. Those are two of my sort of big things I'd, I use to try and help people understand invisible systems. Because bear in mind, most people, most people don't think of, think of an economy like this. If you ask a member of the public, um, very, very often, what they, their imagination of, a, of an economy is like there's a bunch of solo individuals who sort of like have objects and they hand the objects to each other, all right? This is a very common sort of um, uh, background imaginary in economic systems, and it leads to a particular understanding of how money works as well, all right? To sort of deconstruct that, you need to remove this idea of these solo individuals and point out the fact that everybody's actually in a vast interdependent structure that is invisible, that you can't see, all right? Um, an image like this helps a person to imagine themselves like when they're walking down the street, they're not a solo individual, they're actually connected to all sorts of people that they can't actually see, all right? Um, so, one, you know, one of the core metaphors I will use to help people understand monetary systems and therefore to help sort of prob problematize um, the sort of standard progress narrative of money is to use metaphors around casinos and casino chips, all right? Um, and so this can be very, very effective. It's not, it's a, one thing I want to say about this metaphor is that it's stylized. Um, I think, who was, was it, Josh was saying stuff about this like, um, who was the, guy, the box guy who had that thing about all models are incorrect, but some are useful? Yeah, yeah. This is, I do a lot of this stuff around being like, what's a useful metaphor uh, to help like, jog, jog, you know, jolt somebody out of some a complacent belief? Um, and where, where's the balance between accuracy and usefulness? All right? Lots of academics sit in this realm where they try to go into this minutiae of detail and minutiae of accuracy, but alienate the public in the process. All right. I'm, I'm always like trying to find those little sections in between where it's like, what's a useful, usefully accurate or like accurate enough kind of metaphor? And casino chips for me work when it comes to explaining monetary systems because it helps the person to understand the different types of money in a society or the different layers of money. So I ask a person to imagine themselves going to a casino with um, physical cash and you pass it over to the cashier in the casino. They take ownership of that cash and they push out casino chips to you, all right? They issue them out to you. Now, those casino chips that you're holding in a casino are a secondary form of privately issued money that's tethered back to that first form that you handed in, right? But you no longer own the first form, you now own the second form, right? You're hold, holding this casino chip. You can then use it within the confines of the casino, and you can then at later point exit the casino by redeeming it back for the cash, okay? Most people understand this. Most people can make a distinction. They, they can see that the two things look different, and they also have different words to describe them, right? The problem with monetary systems is that we don't have that visual imagery, and we also don't have different words. Um, so I use people to... I, I, I use that metaphor to help people understand their bank balance to say, hey, those units that you see in your bank balance are in fact privately issued digital casino chips pushed out by the banking sector, all right? So when you go to a, go to a bank, hand them cash, for example, um, if that's something you happen to do, there's lots more complex operations that also go on. But like in an old school scenario, you go and hand cash to a bank and suddenly you see your account credited. That's not them crediting the cash it's not, it's not a record of the cash that they're storing for you. They've taken ownership of that state-issued money, and they've pushed out 
digital casino chips to you. That's what you now own. You now own their privately issued money, okay? Um, and then the whole interbank payment system is basically the process where you move these bank-issued digital casino chips around, all right? Um, and what's called cashless payment is basically when you're using the secondary form of bank-issued money um, for uh, all your transactions. Um, I hope that's clear enough. That's a very, like, there's a lot more, a lot more stuff going on in, in monetary systems beyond this here. I'll, I'll, I'll flick through a couple of my new sort of stylized images that I've been, I've been building around this. Because um, I also want, one of the things to do is to try and, uh, like, help people understand <laughs> the different types of operations going on in a monetary system. Um, and so many people don't understand issuance processes, for example. Um, so many people don't understand issuance of money, the fact that there's multiple issues of money in our society. So I've been trying to do these images to help people see how these processes work, all right? To understand these players here, the, the, they have like particular, I, I designed these characters in a story I was doing, in a, in a piece I was doing, right? Uh, so don't worry about their names and stuff. They're, it comes from a story. Um, but you know, when the, when, the, when, the, when the central bank's creating money, um, and the instruction of, for example, a, a nation state, it's pushing out money to the banking sector, a sort of first tier form of money, and then the banking sector pushes out digital casino chips to you, right? So this is like, you know, government money creation. It's a process that happens. But the banking sector itself can do this without the central bank doing anything. So what people sometimes call um, a fractional reserve banking or credit creation of money, is the banking sector just does, just issues out new digital casino chips to people when they come and ask for loans. So you say you want a mortgage, the bank just says, boom, we're gonna push out new chips to you, that's it. There's nothing else happens, right? Um, and so huge amounts of the money creation in our system uh, occurs when banks are just pushing out new money in the process of, process of um, uh, creating new loans, right? Um, and there's a huge amount of politics to that process because banks essentially get to mobilize whatever part of the economy they want to mobilize by pushing out the second tier form of money. All right, so if a banking sector says, you know, we want to mobilize the real estate sector rather than, for example, productive enterprise, they can, and they often do, right? They'll be like, we'll push out shit tons of new digital casino chips into the, into the, into the, um, the housing market, but if you want to do, for example, renewable energy projects, I don't know, we'll, you know, maybe if the government subsidizes our risk, we'll maybe do it for you. But there's all this, this politics around the fact that they have this power um, in, in the monetary system. So that's a huge area. Um, but also, what we were, when, when we're thinking about monetary, uh, the monetary system, we're always imagining the transfer processes. We're imagining money that's already being issued, all right, that we then try to pass between ourselves. And this is where, um, you know, the interbank payment system is the sort of, you know, the, the, um, a massive structure that's going on in our world, and the sort of move to a so-called cashless society is this move to this type of structure, where you basically, in order to interact with people, you're messaging the banking sector saying, please can you move digital casino chips from my account to somebody else's account, right? Which has a whole bunch of background operations that are going on to, to do this. Um, but in this process, an enormous amount of power is being transferred to the banking sector, all right? Not only power, but they're getting huge amounts of data, they're getting fees from this, and they're kind of entrenching themselves with the infrastructure for all kinds of interaction in a society. Um, so this is the, uh, the main digital payment system that exists. Um, and then we can sort of skirt through these last two sections because it's not, too, not necessarily like crucial for our, for our narrative, but many people don't realize that actually lots of interactions in the monetary system destroy money too, right? So when you're paying back a loan, you're basically handing back those casino chips to the bank saying, take them out of circulation, all right? That's what you're doing. You're destroying money every time you pay back loans. You're destroying money every time you pay tax as well, right? Money is being retired from circulation. So the monetary system has this kind of structure where it's being stuff that's being pushed out, it's being moved around, and it's being sucked back in. And this, these processes are going on all the time. So it's this whole pulsating hierarchical structure. And you'll see later that the, in the cryptocurrency communities, there's various elements of this that they really like hate, all right? It's often framed as that the main thing that's hated in the crypto communities is the hierarchical or oligar oligarchical nature of the system, the so-called centralization. But also, and especially in the original Bitcoin movements, there's a hatred of the dynamism, right? The fact that this thing pulsates and is unpredictable and, and these players are pushing out new money and pulling it back in. So in lots, lots of the sort of subsequent 
crypto imagination, they imagine this kind of like rigid structure, right, where there's only transfer processes. There's like a robot that pushes out a set number of units, and then you transfer the units in this very sort of like, kind of like static pattern, okay? And this is one of the reasons why crypto movements really struggle, because this system is so much more powerful, all right? It like eats crypto easily, all right? Which is why all crypto tokens are priced in this system and treated as commodities within the system, all right? Um, I might not have a chance to do it in this talk, but some of the most interesting cutting edge stuff in, in, in monetary stuff is, in, in monetary design, is like, how do you create distributed styles of monetary systems that target the hierarchical nature without sacrificing the dynamical nature, all right? And that's where lots of people who are looking at, for example, self-issued credit systems. Um, I think Tara and Josh watched my talk called Zero is the Future of Money, where I talk about these sort of like, these new wave rippling credit systems that are trying to use some elements of crypto to keep the dynamism, but whilst sort of flattening the hierarchy. Um, anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm digressing here. Uh, one of the important things, though, with this structure is that there's a huge industry behind it, right? Um, this is an earlier version of one of these types of pictures um, that I did. Uh, but, yeah, you can see I do these slightly like, weird abstract things. In this one here, I have the central bank. You know, I use the vertical axis to convey power. Um, and so the, the central bank's up there, and the banks are sort of around it, plugged in. Um, I do, I'm trying to do a similar thing here with the central bank in the middle, the banks kind of hovering around it and then society down below. I do this as an abstraction to sort of try to help people sort of see their position relative to these, these um, players. But you know, players like Visa and MasterCard basically specialize in telling the banks, hey, that person there on the ground is trying to interact with that person and you guys need to move digital casino chips between yourself to facilitate this, this interaction, right? And Visa and MasterCard get paid for that, all right? So they have a huge interest. There's a massive industry behind this whole sort of digital casino chips, right? Um, and there's all these players that plug into it as well, right? Like players like PayPal, for example, go and plug into the banking sector. PayPal originally, for example, had JP Morgan in the background of its interactions, okay? It just plugs in and creates a new interface between you and the banking sector. Um, nowadays, so do stablecoins. Lots of stablecoins do the same thing. Um, but there's this whole structure, and if you imagine yourself in a helicopter, like, flying over it, it might look a bit like this, okay? I have a lot of fun creating these weird images of, of, the, of the banking sector. Um, so if you imagine society down below, um, this player in the middle is a central bank. The banks will hover around, like plugging into the central bank. Um, and then these, all these e-money providers like PayPal and you know, various mobile money people plug into the banking sector. And then the cash system is kind of like central bank reserves that have escaped the system in physical form. All right, that's why I've represented them in the same color. Okay, so you have the sort of um, these layers of the monetary system, but then there's also these different sort of forms of the money system. So the physical form of, of state money versus the digital form of state money. Okay, um, one of the things right now, if you're an ordinary person in society, you get to choose between which part of the system you interact with. You could be doing cash transactions. All right, so I just bought a Coca-Cola down in the shop, and now I use cash. If I'd used uh, a card, I would have plugged into the banking sector. That would have also routed via a whole international payment st structure as well. Um, this is just a simplified rendition of a national one. Um, I might have used PayPal or something like that, which mean, would have been a third tier player. One thing I can't do, though, is I can't use the digital reserves of the central bank. That's not accessible to me. All right? Only the banking sector gets to use that between themselves. Right? That's the sort of their private uh, thing that they, they have access to. Um, and so one of the questions that's been emerging in um, monetary politics, um, in the context of the implosion of the cash system that's been happening in various places, and we can go into like why that implosion has been happening, um, there's a financial stability problem that's emerging in the monetary system. If you think about that metaphor of a casino and casino chips, when you go into an ATM, it's actually a little bit like going to the cashier at a casino saying, um, here's my chip. I'm handing it back to you, give me the cash, and I'm going to leave, right? When you go to an ATM, you're basically taking your digital casino chip, handing it back to the bank, saying, eliminate it and, pull, and, and release cash for me so I can exit your systems, all right? Um, there's a huge problem that starts to happen if you don't have access to those systems. For example, if the banking sector starts shutting down those ATMs, what they're basically doing is shutting down exits to their system. Imagine going to a casino and not being able to redeem your chips, all right? If you go to the casino cashier and they say, 
we're no longer going to redeem this for you, all right? Not only is that a kind of like attack on your sort of legal rights, but it's also attack on the actual, your belief probably in that chip itself. You're saying like, what exactly am I holding if it is not redeemable, all right? Back for some sort of foundational form. Um, and this is one of the big things that's starting to emerge. What happens if you can't cash your digital chips? There's legal implications, but there's financial stability problems as well. One of the, big, one of the biggest reasons that people hold on to cash is, to pres is a, as a hedge against crises. Um, what happened the, the early, early days of COVID, everyone thinks that COVID was this massive, caused a massive decline in cash. It's true, COVID caused a massive decline in transactional usage of cash, precisely because people were blocked from using lots of physical interaction. But actually, ATM withdrawals spiked massively when COVID happened, precisely because when there's systemic risk, people want to retreat from the banking sector and go back to the sort of first tier type of money, all right? You see this example also with, for example, hurricanes. Like the Federal Reserve will show that when a hurricane's approaching the US, massive spike in cash withdrawals, right? People don't want to be exposed to both the actual system infrastructure, but also the actual financial stability risks of, of banks. So they, they retreat back to the safe form. So, that, so if you no longer have access to cash, there's all those financial stability problems. And this is one of the things that's currently playing into the so-called CBDC debates, um, which is sometimes called the digital euro or the digital pound, depending on where you're going, right? But basically what those debates are, um, if, I don't know if you've encountered these debates, but it's not about introducing a new form of digital money. It's about giving access to an older form of digital money to a much wider range of people, all right? It's saying, should we allow members of the public to access the digital reserves of the central bank as a new payments option, something that you currently do not have the option to do, all right? And that's basically the CBDC debate for you, if you're, if you're interested in it. The way it's presented in the press is like, government thinks to introduce new digital currency. It's not. It's government considers whether to give you access to the central bank or not to let you into the club or not, all right? Um, and so what's, you can immediately see what the politics of this are, right? The banking sector is traditionally the ones who run the digital systems, right? And now there's a potentiality of having um, a member of the public being able to like download a, you know, um, Federal Reserve app or Bank of England app where they could potentially have direct access to the central bank. Um, and that obviously runs counter to the business interests of the banking sector. So they're lobbying the hell out of CBDC right now, all right? Because they're very concerned that if the central bank actually allows people to access that, they'll be quote unquote disintermediated, right? Which is a sort of euphemistic way of saying people will have a new option other than the banking sector, all right? Um, and so that's, and so what's actually happening in reality in the CBDC debates right now is the central bank is stuck in this very weird position, right? Because they, um, on the one hand, they're supposed to provide, create, keep the integrity of the monetary system, and the monetary system holds the capitalist system together, right? On the other hand, they're supposed to protect the banking sector, which are their members. So they, they don't want to displease the banks, but they also don't want to let the banks fuck up the monetary system by get called, allowing the cash system to implode, all right? So they're stuck in the situation. Um, and so what they're doing is they're trying to water down the CBDC proposals to say, well, we might have to do this for financial stability purposes, but, uh, we will impose limits on how much the public can use. Or we'll let you, the banking sector, be the actual arbitrators or the, the intermediaries that people have to go through to access this. All right, these sort of public-private partnerships. And that's the current state of this debate. Albeit in libertarian circles, they're kind of fantasizing about a kind of like gigantic sort of communist takeover of the monetary system, um, which is, of course, in an actual capitalist countries, central banks do not want to destroy their own banking sectors, right? They actually like the fact that the banking sector does all this stuff for them. Um, how are you guys? Can I have, do I have 10 more minutes that I can use, or is it? Okay, now for many people in the public, this kind of stuff is a bit too technical sometimes, right? It's like, okay, the structure of the monetary system and the sort of big power players and their, how, how they're interacting with each other. So sometimes when I'm engaging members of the public, I have to use a slightly different metaphor set. Um, and so I have a, a kind of return to the transport metaphors around money. Okay, so I talk about the dangers of full payments uberfication. Okay, um, as I mentioned, under the, the sort of transnational digital ideology and all that kind of stuff, 
you have this, this setup where you know, cash is seen as a sort of redundant horse cart of payments that has to make way, it'll be upgraded into this new and more advanced form. Um, but the easiest way to really mess with this is just to reframe this, this metaphor like this, right? Um, cash being the bicycle of payments and cards and apps um, being the Uber of payments, right? It immediately changes the public perception when you, when you realize this. Because in this old form here, you're like, well, that's naturally negative. And also, I have a sports car, which I am in control of, all right? Whereas with a bicycle, you say, actually, the, so the one you have more control of is a bicycle. That one relies upon third-party intermediaries to hold it up for you, basically, right? Um, so people understand with transport systems and many systems in general that actually you want diversity in the system, right? And this actually runs contrary to the standard ideology, right? The ideology that we find in the public is like digital everything, but most people, when you take them aside and you, and you say, do you think a system should have a balance of power between different players, they, they recognize that that's a sound principle, right? That's an important principle of resilience and balance of power. And so they say, you know, I might like the Uber app. I might find it useful in certain contexts, but that does not mean I ask the city to remove the bicycle lanes, am I, right? So people can conceptualize, you can hold more than one thing at once. Um, and this is a very, very powerful metaphor to use if you're ever trying to like mess with people's conceptions of cash, especially younger people, right? So whenever I was going around with, with um, cloud money, I'd have these sort of young journalists who would come and they'd be like, well, you know, but isn't it, you know, I very seldom use cash and da 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 da. And you, you sort of, this, this metaphor comes up and you can sort of just see this like, the brain, like, kind of like the, the cogs, like sort of rearranging themselves, being like, oh shit, like, like, oh, like, you know, because that whole kind of, um, perception that newer means better gets fucked up with the, the bike metaphors because everyone knows the bicycle is actually a sort of simpler and older form of transport and yet nowadays it's incredibly modern and progressive right especially in an age of like climate change and all this kind of stuff with digital stress and stuff people like their, their bicycles um, so i really love using this metaphor to sort of talk about systems more generally and balances of power and systems so balance of power is, is my, the main way i would use to talk about um, the politics of payment um, about how you know, we don't have to reject digital systems, but you've got to keep a balance of power in the system in order to prevent the worst excesses of those systems coming out. Because everybody knows, you, know, you might find Uber pleasant right now, but imagine in a thought experiment if Uber was the only way you could travel. That thing very quickly ceases to be convenient and pleasant. It becomes oppressive in that context, right? Actually, Uber's positive side only exists insofar as you don't have to use it, all right? It depends upon there being an outside to it. And it's a similar, uh, it's a good uh, way to frame lots of sort of the payments uberfication. Um, it's true that people might superficially find digital payments to be a kind of convenient thing, but when you have total payments uberfication, that oppression starts to emerge, right? Um, so the balance of power we're talking about is, you know, on the one hand, autonomy versus dependence. Um, so if you go to a sort of person on sort of the center of the politi political spectrum, I'm not talking about like a crypto hacker right now, but a person who's just a sort of, um, you know, in the political center, and you say, do you mind having a moderate degree of dependence on institutions in the society? Most of them say, that's fine. I don't mind being moderately dependent. Do you want to be fully dependent upon institutions? That's a very different story. Right? People want to maintain a balance of power between how much they're dependent on things and how much autonomy they have. All right? um, if you're in the hacker circles, they want like, full autonomy. But for most people, this is just like, untenable. It's too, too much energy to have full autonomy. Right? But they want this balance, and you can work with it. And they also have this balance of power between public and private. All right? To say, you know, do you want full private infrastructure or a balance of power between public infrastructure and private infrastructure? And this is the best way to frame payment systems as well than monetary systems. Um, and from this, you can start to derive a whole bunch of other principles that become very reasonable for people when you're talking about the cash system. So one is resilience versus system vulnerability. One of the big things about um, the cash system is that it stands up when digital systems go down, um, at least in certain contexts. Um, so one of the sort of metaphors I use to help people understand that the politics of this is to talk about you know, skyscrapers, to say, hey, you know, if you're in a skyscraper, uh, you know, the, the lift system might look very convenient, but that doesn't mean you want the emergency stairs removed out of the lift, right? The emergency stairs are super crucial. 
But if you are talking to a property developer, a very short-sighted property developer, they might say, hey, you know, stairs, they're so old school. Nobody uses stairs anymore. Wow, it's, it's, they're so costly. Stairs are so costly to put into a building. All right? This is exactly how the digital payments industry talks about. They always harp on about the cost of cash. Oh, it's so costly to have this infrastructure. Just switch to the new efficient infrastructure. It's a very self-interested industry-centric narrative for a particular set of power players, right? Um, um, one of the other really big ones is inclusion versus exclusion. Uh, digital systems, obviously, um, and this plays back into that sort of narrative I was saying earlier about you know, the left behind story and the inclusion story, right? Uh, so this is actually one of the most mainstream ways you can mobilize sort of politicians because they are already used to the, the inclusion exclusion concept. All right, so you, you say there's lots of people who can't access these digital systems, they get excluded, but not only the people who don't uh, who can't access the digital systems, people who don't want to access the digital systems, right? This is a very underappreciated element of this. Not everybody wants to constantly be plugged into their phone all the time. There are people who actually want to resist this constant, like, plugging in, and they increasingly can't in certain places. You're basically forced to be plugged in, all right? And once that happens, you also have this, inc this increased ability for deliberate exclusion, so once you're dependent upon these systems, then you have this huge new political vector, which is to say, well, you're dependent upon this now, but if I exclude access to you, you're basically screwed. All right, so this becomes a big um, political tool once you have, especially in a capitalist economy where you can't survive unless you're doing monetary exchange. Um, privacy versus surveillance is a really big one. Um, I don't really need to go into this, but obviously there's a bunch of stuff around cash maintains um, privacy, whereas digital systems don't. I'm going to actually skirt over this one because this one's one of the most popular narratives in the public about it, um, and so it doesn't really need that much more uh, explanation. But one of the really underappreciated ones is localization versus centralization in the economy. If you're interested in providing a balance of power in your economy, um, all these digital systems, at least the mainstream ones, promote centralization de facto. All right. So if you think about the structure of an old like 1950s economy. Um, imagine you're going into a store and you're buying some like Heinz baked beans or you're buying some kind of like, I don't know, product from Nestle. There's a big corporation sitting there somewhere, but their product is now detached from them, right? And now you're interacting at a local level with cash with some small scale store owner for this corporate product, right? So there's some degree of centralization still there, but there's also a bunch of localization happening. Now compare this to a situation where you're having to interact via Amazon and a smartphone for like, or maybe not Amazon, but you're trying to just, let's say, a, code, a cashless interaction in a small-scale store somewhere. Basically, every single small-scale interaction is rooting through a large-scale player, which means they benefit from every local interaction that happens in the economy, rather than just, like, um, some of them, all right? This whole digital intermediation thing is a massive transfer of power to the, cent the center of the economy. Um, and this, again, in the crypto world, they, they do a sort of aspire to, to deal with. Um, Text versus frictionless in, a, in an expanding economy, one of the big things that's in the ideology is that speed is better, all right? But for a human being, that's not actually true. Human beings are tactile, physical beings, and we actually, at some point, get sick of being accelerated, all right? And one of the most perverse elements of the cash debate right now is that these players, like Visa, which has created this uh, blue block here on the right, gloat about how you can accelerate payments by forcing people to go digital. All right, they say, you know, people spend 25 to 30 to 40% more basically with digital payments. This is, and this is on their website called the benefits of going cashless, where they're trying to convince small shops to force people to use the digital infrastructure, all right, to become dependent upon it. And there's a whole bunch of these studies which basically say human beings don't understand digital payments, right? You actually end up spending so much more money with digital payments than with cash transactions because with a cash transaction, you have this sort of... Um, sense of like a, a sort of movement or kind of this friction is actually very important for helping you to understand the interaction. Um, I'm kind of rushing a bit right now. I could go into it, but this is one of the big, big things that's being attacked. Um, but maybe the thing that really grates me the most in this debate, all right, informality versus formality. And this is another balance of power question, all right? If you live in a totally informal economy, it can be very chaotic. It can be very disempowering. But if you live in a totally formalized economy, by which I mean an economy where all interactions go through big formal institutions, it starts to feel sterile. It starts to feel corporate, right? It feels horribly gentrified. This is like the actual a complete change in the vibe of an economy when that happens. 
Actually, what people like in an economy is some degree of certainty, some degree of formalization, but not total formalization. The thing about all these interactions right here, you know, being able to sell lemonade on the side of the road, having an honesty box for your eggs on, on a farm, you know, donating money at a church, you know, weddings, people throwing money at the bride, all this kind of stuff. These are all informal interactions, and actually it's a very, very important cultural, part, uh, cultural sphere in the economy, this right to have these sort of small-scale interactions. But basically, the aspiration in most sort of digital innovation rhetoric is this. Plug all of this, insert a, a, a digital infrastructure between all of this, right? And basically remove all that informal interaction. And you can feel this when you go to so-called cashless stores and sort of areas of London where everything's become turned into this. You actually can feel the structure there. All right, you have the superficial appearance of, they say, like small indie stores and stuff. But in the reality, they're all plugged into the big tech, big finance architectures. And you can like sense it in the difference between those players and, for example, the older forms of informal economy activities that were used to happen in these places and these places that are getting gentrified. All right? So this, the imagined independence of the independent stores is an illusion. Right? The truly independent stores were the ones that were actually not plugged into the structure. Okay. Um, so this is the big thing that's going on. I might actually cut it there because I was going to do a whole section on crypto, but now I'm probably going on too long now. So um, I was going to talk about how the fact that you know, this has now become part of the big AI economy because obviously AI thrives upon data and getting data about small scale economic interactions is a, is a massive part of the digital payment system. So there's a big interconnection now between the AI systems and these digital payment systems. Um, and in the imagination of the crypto world, at least one of the things that was at least in the sort of original concept was to like build a sort of flattened version of this vast kind of automated in uh, in infrastructure. And one of the problems we find in the crypto world is that, well, not necessarily problems, but one of the interesting dynamics of it is that it doesn't actually uh, have a critique of the sort of acceleration and automation processes. It really critiques who controls them, right? So it basically goes along with it, saying we will accept automation. Actually, and sometimes some, some these, in the, the hyper-libertarian versions, these extreme versions of it, where like everything is turned into some kind of automated tradable commodity. Um, so they'll actually accept that trajectory, but they'll just sort of say, well, we want it in this, this more distributed fashion. Um, and what I'm being trying to push for peop to people is to, um, let's find, find around Bitcoin. Um, is to, is to sort of think about how do you actually maintain an authentic balance of power um, because in the end, all these digital systems, regardless of who controls the digital system, they all have certain affordances and certain features that stand in opposition, collectively in opposition to the, the non-digital systems. All right? So actually, if you're interested in being truly radical about economic or like monetary systems, you've got to think about cash. All right? In a way, it's kind of like expected that you should think about digital money when you're in, under a digital ideology. It's not actually that radical to imagine a like, slightly more decentralized digital architecture. What's authentically interesting to me is like, how do you build a narrative that goes beyond digital hype? Right? How do you sort of think outside of that, that system? And this is going to be especially important in a future where we've got resource shortages, climate change, and actually huge amounts of digital burnout. People are literally starting to feel sick like actually physically sick from digital systems. And I think it's short-sighted to imagine that the only sort of path ahead is to imagine sort of alternative versions of a digital future. All right, and just, I think we need to stretch our imagination beyond that. Um, and I will end there. Sorry I had to rush towards the end, um, but hopefully that gave you a little inkling of what's, what I'm thinking.